Good evening, everyone. Welcome to New Canaan Library's Authors on Stage program, which we are pleased to co-sponsor with Elm Street Books. Our special guest author tonight is Benjamin Bush, who wrote Dust to Dust, a beautifully written memoir. More than a war journal, Dust to Dust is a thoughtful, profound meditation on our collective passage through life. Bush readily admits, and early in the book, that he was attracted to a solitary life, even as a young child. He was especially drawn to the elemental, the wilderness, the natural power and force of rain, oceans, rivers, and the ruins of nature and man. War was a wilderness, and I went there too, states Bush in his prologue. As Bush writes, taking the reader from childhood stories to tense combat scenes, the underlying thread is is an acute awareness of man's mortality, of life and loss, and a child's curiosity that ever remains. Benjamin Bush was born in Manhattan in 1968 and grew up in rural New York State. He is an actor, a photographer, a film director, and a U.S. Marine Corps infantry officer who served two combat tours in Iraq. He played the officer Anthony Colicchio in the HBO series The Wire and has appeared on Homicide, The West Wing, and Generation Kill. His writing has been featured in Harper's and has been twice nominated for the Pushcart Prize. He has also been a guest commentator on NPR's All Things Considered, and he lives on a farm in Michigan with his wife and two daughters. Please join me in welcoming Benjamin Bush. Thank you. I'd like to have uh, you precede me everywhere. If I could do that. It's, it does sound a little, uh, a little unlikely when it's all listed in succession, but uh, I've always been a little complicated. Thank you all so very much for coming. Uh, first of all, in support of libraries and independent bookstores, but also specifically in support of this particular book, which um, I am shocked to have written. <laughs> uh, I thought I could solve most of my expression by way of visual means. I'm a visual artist. And uh, it turns out that I ran into my limits. Um, when I returned from my second combat tour, I got home on my daughter's very first birthday. She was one and had no idea who I was. And there was something strange about that, you know, being reunited with my child. And neither of us had much knowledge of one another. We didn't have that uh, instinctual need to be uh, together. Uh, she hid behind my wife. <laughs> she was still very cute and smiled a lot, but, uh, but she had no idea that, that I was hers. And within a year, I lost both of my parents. And it went from that strange period of seeing a child brought into the world and having a certain responsibility, of course, and love for that, and then having my own childhood es essentially by definition ended by becoming an orphan. And even at any age, it's a shocking occurrence because uh, I think we have a certain belief in the immortality of our parents as children. Um, it kind of gets buried by experience and consequence over time, but it doesn't go away. We still kind of have that five-year-old's perspective. And whether you've survived your childhood or thrived from it, I thrive from mine. Um, there's so much about your childhood which echoes in your life and defines um, your your impulses that have kind of taken you where you are. Um, I always hope, and this book hopes to kind of reset that native urge, whatever your organic uh, kind of impulses are, to go back and revisit them. And a lot of us have kind of been stewarded away from what we wanted, what we thought we were most meant to do by just the economics of life or, uh, or our surroundings. But uh, I think it was Emily Bronte maybe who said it's never too late to be what you might have been. And so this, uh, this book tries to put you back in your landscape again and um, lets you define yourself uh, as the child once did. So um, the book began really at my parents' death. Um, I had only written really letters home from Iraq before that. I wasn't, I, and scripts, which are entirely different. Uh, if you look in this book, there's probably about six pages of dialogue if you put all the dialogue in the book together. I don't have an oral memory. I have a visual memory. I have almost a photographic memory for imagery. 
I can recreate spaces in my head very quickly and very accurately, but I can't remember the exact language of what was said in conversation, which is very annoying. Um, when I write scripts, it's all dialogue. It's 90 pages of dialogue. You know, the scene would be interior library day. <laughs> That's it. You know, uh, figure out the rest. But uh, the rest is all made up. Um, in this one, I wanted to be accurate. I wanted to, to bring things verbatim. I count things that my mother told me 17 times in a row um, as being what was said, even if I didn't remember it being said that way. Um, so I, I began to look for them as what the child does. You know, a child's always kind of secretly looking for their parents, um, even after they, they have out, outgrown the necessity for their direct protection. And um, to find them, all I had was memory. So memoir was thus the, the avenue by which I, w I walked back to them. And I discovered them, as they always were, in our kitchen. That's where my parents were. And I think kind of in writing this book, what I did most of the time was I went and sat in the kitchen uh, in, my, in my memory of it. When I was eight, we all kind of always sat in the same seat. You know, uh, refrigerators were always in the same spot. The stove was always in the same spot. The doorways never changed. The light came from the windows in a certain way. Everyone moved around the kitchen in a very uh, habitual manner. And if I sat there at night, you know, 11 o'clock at night with my pile of papers in front of me, uh, I eventually could see the kitchen very clearly. And then all you have to do is stand up and walk around your house. It all comes right back, um, very quickly for me anyway. And I wanted to kind of recreate that uh, in a book. And so I divided it into the elements. Every, every chapter begins with something particular, bone, stone, soil, water, metal. And as they, as they progress from childhood to adulthood in each chapter, uh, I'm staying on message. I want you to really look at the element and its place in the environment, its place in landscape, and the place in your life. I think uh, if I get it right, the most important story is the readers as they go through here. If you're distracted by your life, then I win. <laughs> this is not an autobiography, so don't, don't be fooled. Um, I use you know, stories of myself because that's who I have. That's who I know. And this is really just a portrait of my particular perspective, this whole book is me giving you my eyes and hoping that somehow they make an impression. You see something new um, because you see the way I see. That's why I, I start in childhood. I kind of give you the way I see. And if you have a sense for, you know, through these stories, if you have a sense for me, the messenger, then I can't, I have to hope that you can't help but understand the message. You know, you get used to my peculiarities, I guess it were. Um, since I'm in a library, my mother was a librarian, and I have a whole chapter called Wood, which, of course, we're surrounded by in shelves and pulp. Um, I'll just read a piece beginning Wood. Gives you a sense for how chapters often begin, setting us in the element, and then how that element becomes the thing we really build the, the journey around. So this is the begin, beginning of chapter six, Wood. Trees seem to be random, their arrival in fields and the top of hills unexplainable, their growth mysterious. It is hard to imagine the wood of trees while they stand, but inside there is something magical happening. The growth of trees is not repetitive, but additive, each year recorded in their flesh. Cut wood can be burnished like clay, polished to show its grain like stone, and on the shore, bleached driftwood looks like worn bone. Wood is known for how it burns more than for how it grows, but it is trees that most clearly mark time. The destruction of a tree by axe, rot, or fire is an assurance that memory is not intended to survive. Trees grow with us. One day, while we lived in Poolville, which is a small town I grew up in, in upstate New York, my family went for a drive. There was no particular reason for it other than that my parents wanted to see the countryside in winter. My brother and I sat in the back of the station wagon as we drove out into the great white cold of central New York. It was before Christmas because there were boxes of books in the back of the car that my father had not yet donated to the library for the tax year. The car whistled as we went and always felt frigid in the back, a large empty bay incapable of holding any heat. The roads farthest from the village were plowed last, 
and my parents chose to drive onto one that had not yet been cleared, identifiable only by the recent truck tracks and a row of skeletal maples lining its shoulder. We moved on the confidence my father had in the new snow tires he had bought. He relied on local wisdom for all mechanical matters and would quote mechanics as if they were philosophers. He'd grown up in Brooklyn and somehow maintained an urban perspective on the natural world despite his long tenure in rural territory. It had been little more than momentum that had kept us from being trapped by the deepening snow. The tracks we had followed turned off. My father hesitated, and the car slowed to a stop. They decided that they had seen enough, and my father tried to turn around. The wheels spun and revealed the smooth ice below the snow. My mother offered advice, which was to gun the engine and rock in their seat. My father got out and looked at the road as if something was wrong with it. I got out too, and we stood examining the polished ice and tire treads packed smooth with snow. They talked strategy. I suggested that we use fallen branches from the maple as traction and went to gather some, but when I returned with an armful of sticks, my father had already taken action. He had arranged his old books, open, packed in front of each tire. <laughs> I was shocked. I thought my mother, a librarian, would never allow it. But she sat in the front, far from town, resigned to accept forfeiture. I stood outside, still holding the sticks as my father got in, started the engine, and hit the gas. The wheels stripped pages and threw them in a plume behind the car. A few were mangled, but many simply tore free and were thrown like large sheets of confetti. The paper did not look like snow and was noticeable on the road. One of the books was by Dickens, a duplicate he had found in a box of books bought for a few dollars at an auction. My father got out, and we looked at the pages blown over the snow. He could tell that I was horrified. But he smiled and said, Dickens would be proud to know that his book had been sacrificed to save little boys. <laughs> we had watched A Christmas Carol that year, and I had seen Oliver in London. I guessed that he was right. We were eventually rescued by a plow and went home to soup and less confidence in snow tires. A farmer walking along his field in spring would find, spread along his fence, pages of Dickens caught in the barbs with the dry leaves of fall. Wood. <laughs> Thank you. The large bright blue screen is meant to mesmerize you. It's, uh, it's a sales technique. I don't know why, but people buy books because of it. Um, how many of you have seen The Wire? Good citizens, good citizens. Okay, if you've seen all five seasons, you're allowed to vote in my country. <laughs> if you haven't, Netflix will be your friend. It's highly suggested. Um, I was always being killed in front of my parents. This might surprise some of you. Um, I was a martial creature, and I was always setting up warfare and recreating it in our backyard, building forts, and gathering local boys for these, uh, these large conflicts, which of course resulted in nothing because we were just saying bang. But, um, but I wasn't allowed to have a gun. My parents were uh, war protesters and they didn't want to encourage me in the way of, uh, of martial arms. So uh, I would always have a sword made out of a maple stick and I would always be killed because you can't win with a sword in a gunfight. It's just, you know, I knew the certain realities were going to come into this, even though it was magical play. So uh, behind the house, pretty much every weekend, I would be killed in front of my parents. And I never really thought about what that meant. I didn't really kind of think about the fact that my parents' only job was to keep me from being killed. That's their whole job for life, is the parents', the parents mission, is to, uh, to keep their child safe. And there I was, rehearsing my death <laughs> over and over again. And uh, when I was in London, I was finally put in a play, and I thought, this is, this is great. Um, I, w I dressed up as a Celt to fight the Romans. <laughs> and, you know, you have to understand that in England, uh, they take drama very seriously. And in America, we dress up in these pumpkin outfits and bump into each other, and, you know, our parents would film it and clap, and it was a disaster. But it made everyone happy. In England, we had full-on speeches, you know, Queen Boudicca, the Roman emperors, 
and then we'd all dress up like real, you know, these kids had elaborate Roman armor, and I had an embarrassing Celtic outfit that I had made myself uh, with a tomato box shield, and it was just all bad. But, but what I did have was uh, a lot of practice in dying. So when I was killed by the Romans, as we all were because we were the Celts, um, I had an elaborate death scene resulting in the play halting for a moment to make sure that I wasn't dead. <laughs> and I threw myself off the stage, and this is kind of the first time th that I thought I was a professional performer and also a Celt. Um, <laughs> so everything w wound to a stop, and then I, I realized that through my life, looking back at it, that uh, pretty much all my parents got to see was me preparing for my death scene, <laughs> and then somehow not actually dying, um, which was the luck, the luck of it. So um, when I was in the Marines, I, I went to Vassar College. Right? I was a studio art major making prints and drawings and sculpture, which usually sends a shock through an audience because I promptly joined the Marine Corps Infantry. And a lot of people don't realize that most of, uh, of the Marine Corps officers are actually studio art major Vassar graduates. <laughs> um, we don't want anyone to know that we're, we're all out there looking for nuance, not for the enemy. <laughs> but um, while I was there, I, and I did four years after Vassar, and then um, nothing much was happening in 1996, so I got out the first time, finding myself immediately drawn back into the reserves. But um, in that little period, I, I thought that I, it was time for me to, to explore film, it's something I always wanted to do since, since George Lucas damn him, uh, he made Star Wars and blew my mind at age eight uh, or ten. So um, I wanted to get into film, I didn't want to go to school for it, I was more of a, an experiential, observational person. I, the, uh, the book way of making a film didn't quite work for me, whereas seeing someone make it was all I needed forever. So I wanted to sneak onto set somehow and find a way into acting and find a way into filmmaking. And I figured if I could get on set, I could reverse engineer how it was made. If it cost them $100 million, I could figure out the seven people I needed, really, to make the whole thing for 10 grand, <laughs> which is what I've done ever since. <laughs> so uh, this is kind of that transition, and of course, with the backstory of the fact that my parents were constantly uh, tortured by my, my recurring death, this just made it official. After a three-year tour in Camp Lejeune in the infantry, my wife and I moved to a little house in College Park, Maryland, our first home together. I'd won an audition for Homicide, Life in the Street, because it was a good television show, and it was filmed in Baltimore, only 30 minutes from our house. It was, in fact, the only local show at the time, and it was probably the only chance I had at a significant role. I'd given my headshots to the casting agent months before, and I was called in to play an extra. They said nothing more that I would need to wear shorts, bring slippers, and a bathrobe. Yeah, I should have known, right? <laughs> I arrived on set excited to be in the middle of the production, and a production assistant boarded me onto a van to go to the hair and makeup trailer. I was informed that I was to play a corpse, <laughs> which was disappointing. I sat shirtless as my death was applied to me, I was covered with a pale paste where they thought I would be seen in the partially unzipped body bag, and a large hatchet wound was sculpted onto my forehead with wax and opaque shades of blood paints. It was an impressive wound. I dressed in my bathrobe and slippers, got into another van, and was driven a block to the set. In a small warehouse separated from the Baltimore Harbor by a dock where the water ride stopped was a morgue. It had been built for the show, which often brought its detectives there to examine the fictitious dead. There were extras milling around in lab coats and film crews setting up the room for the shoot. I was directed to a stainless steel table, and I carefully slid into the body bag. Even though the room was heated, the table was still cold. Another extra sat beside me with a pad, as if taking notes of what could only be the most obvious cause of death in history. As I lay there, I did not participate in the bored banter of the other insignificant players and corpses. I wanted to be noted as professional <laughs> and focused. I heard the actors speak their lines for camera tests while I kept my eyes closed. Then Stannins stepped in as lighting was adjusted and the actors rested or continued rehearsing elsewhere. 
I remained on the table. I did not speak. I waited as the actors were brought back and filming began. I held my breath and controlled my instinct to shiver until they called cut. If anyone had seen me, they would believe that I was not alive. They began to shuttle people away for lunch, which was set up somewhere down the street, and the actors disappeared along with the crew. I lay on the table. <laughs> I had no intention of moving until directed to do so. The set lights clicked off and the warehouse grew quiet. I sat up in the body bag. I was alone. I had not followed the herd out of the building to wait for rides and had been left behind. It occurred to me that no one was going to direct me anywhere. I slipped out of the bag and off the table, walked backstage, found my bathrobe and slippers and walked outside. It was December in Baltimore. <laughs> Bitter cold, and I didn't know the area very well. A member of the crew was walking back with a plate and I asked if there was a shuttle coming. He seemed surprised to see me and gave directions to the church where the catering was laid out. I would have to walk. I began to head up the street in my bathrobe and slippers my bare legs feeling strange as the cold wind struck them. I felt remarkably exposed. I walked across Thames Street where people were Christmas shopping and felt myself being noticed. <laughs> I smiled at couples as they stared, unsure of what they thought they were witnessing. I had forgotten how my head must have looked. There were many homeless people stumbling around Baltimore, mad with drugs or savage with long disregard. I could have been one of them insane with imaginary heat and the chill of winter. I arrived at the church where the vans were parked and went in the front entrance. As I stepped through the large wooden doors, I looked directly into a classroom of black children who promptly went silent. <laughs> it took me a moment to see that lunch was downstairs in the church basement. I stood, blanched, a gaping wound on my forehead in a bathrobe. The children stared as the dead white man descended the stairs and joined the rest of the damned beneath the church. After we ate, the shuttle returned us to the set where I lay back on the table and they finished the scene. Afterward, hair and makeup was busy, so they just gave me some wipes designed for removing makeup and I dressed in my regular clothes. I drove home with the makeup on. I stopped at a 7-Eleven near our house and bought a soda. <laughs> The clerk gave me my change and pretended not to notice that I had been killed. <laughs> he was very polite. At home, I looked at myself in the mirror. It was good work. The split skin of my forehead, the drained color of my face. I began to wash it off in the sink, my skin red with rubbing, and the wax wound shaved off with a butter knife. I was alive again. Later, I watched the episode, eager to see my performance as a dead man. I appeared briefly in the background, out of focus, unrecognizable, my wound unnoticeable, and all the attention paid to details surrounding me were impossible to see. I was, as the dead are, blurred, transformed, faded. A year later, I was called in to audition for a serial killer and returned to the set in Baltimore. In the series finale, in winter again, I was killed the last homicide on the show, and I lay for hours in a pool of red syrup, my hair actually frozen to the sidewalk. <laughs> I lay there in between takes as the crew piled blankets on me. I wanted to be a professional. I didn't complain, and I didn't move. I held my breath while they rolled film. When the episode aired, my parents said that they couldn't watch. <laughs> See me, uh, see me dead, it's enough. Um, I'm going to show a little clip. Um, that's how, how lucky Connecticut is. <laughs> they actually have the ability to show a little clip. Um, this is a film I just shot with friends from The Wire and Generation Kill, essentially, for $10,000 and just the crew that I needed. Uh, in LA five days and um, I wrote this film at the same time that I was writing the book and I uh, started off the, the, the book actually began as 12 chapters and underground and dust became soil and the rest of it kind of blew away wind blew into a few other chapters and then disappeared just kind of broken away um, and 
uh, ice was broken up and became some of stone and some of water, and then the rest was, was tossed. And the last chapter, which never, no, was never even written, but I thought about, was light, another kind of element, but not quite an element that I could grapple with. So I stayed with the, uh, the tactile things and got rid of wind and light and underground because they weren't particular enough for me digging into. And um, we have effects of them, but not the feeling of them in the same way. So uh, this, this film became, it was called Bright. I didn't even realize that basically it's the chapter on light that I didn't write about the childhood that I wasn't even thinking about the entire time, which of course is all I was thinking about. Uh, it's about a guy who simply cannot escape his childhood. Can't go back, can't go forward, and he, he goes with something that he can control, he thinks, light, which he makes, he repairs uh, antique lights. And he always has his back to the sun wherever I have him in a shot. Um, light, real light, is something that he doesn't acknowledge. And the first beginning of it is all about kind of childhood. You know, this book is about the fact that I'm going back. I'm taking you back, I hope, into uh, certain elements of your childhood. And um, you kind of see this guy in his place. His, uh, he's kind of been adopted by a blind man when he was very, very young and found homeless in a, uh, in a um, used clothing store. And uh, this led to, I'll let the first two kind of uh, free scenes let them play out, It'd probably be about five minutes. So if you need to sleep, you got five minutes. <laughs> so this is where we tech test my uh, technical acumen. that time. Dang. Oh, I almost had this one together, but it's missing a fitting. This one's wore out. Yeah, I'm wore out. I'll crash soon. We have to go downtown in the morning. Jaeger will have one of these. Remember, you got that guy coming in first thing. Oh, I remember him. Nothing's wrong with his light. It just isn't right. I know what he means. Nothing wrong with my eyes, but I can't see. Well, I can't make starlight. Sometimes you just have to settle for the best you can get. Don't you ever want to go see the stars? It's too bright here in the city. You can't see the sky at night. You have to go where it's dark. You're never going to see the stars from here. I don't need to see them that bad. Anyway, the sun's a star. Yeah, well. Don't go staring at that too long. Go blind. Good night. Good night.
you with that. I love peeling my oranges. You spend more time peeling than eating. Well, there's a pleasure in discovery. You already know there's an orange inside. Have you ever peeled one and found something else? We didn't have oranges if I grew up. Have you ever gone back? Where? Home. No. It's a long way from here. On the other side. East across the desert. Road passes through empty land, then prairie, then wheat. Barely a single light on earth for hundreds of miles from here. The sky lit like a city. I can't imagine. really bad. Haven't you ever wanted to go back to the place you started? Someday. You can't ever do that. A child can only go back to that place as a child. I'm something else now. And besides, I figure I wouldn't recognize the place if I saw it again anyway. You know, people long gone and the sounds have probably all changed. Gotten new. Have you ever been outside this place? No. You know I haven't. Look, I was just wondering if you remember from before. I don't remember anything from before. I don't understand why you keep asking me. I've been here so long, I'm afraid to leave anyway. Someone said, we must travel in the direction of our fear. That doesn't sound like very good advice. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Wait, what does that even mean? Fear would travel towards safety. Oh, they're saying run away. That's good advice, actually. No. It means you must travel towards that which frightens you. Become brave. That's back to bad advice. What if you're afraid of sharks? Peel never saves the orange. Peel never saves the orange, indeed. So you can never go back to that place as anything but a child. Uh, that message obviously came out of the fact that I was going back into my childhood and dealing with a lot of these things. Uh, it's a the film's a contemplation if you're waiting for the action sequence. Uh, <laughs> you're waiting for a long time. And it's one of those, it's one, of those one, uh, one glass of red wine films. And you sit back with no distractions and just kind of let it happen. But it is. It's just a, you know, it's a, it's a meditation on, uh, on where we are. And the book does some of that, too. Um, so how are we doing on time? We're going to get uh, beat around the head and neck by the police, or are we doing all right? Are there any questions, comments, or witty remarks that I should probably address at this point before I... Uh, I can read a lot. I mean, it's kind of cheating. It's 320 pages, and I could go forever. Uh, I'm familiar with most of it. <laughs> and, um, any questions? Anyone? I can keep on going. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'm not my parents, and they realized that very early. Um, the great thing about my parents, among other many great things, because they were awesome, uh, is that despite the fact that they worried about who I actually organically and intuitively was, they never destroyed that. They let me be who I was. And even though they kept certain things from me, they didn't keep me from certain things, if you know the difference. You know, they wouldn't give me a gun, but they didn't stop me from joining the Marines. You know, and they couldn't anyway. Uh, 
I knew I was doing that. You know, the, the book kind of shows that everything that I am now, which sounds like a strange resume, I was at age six. And I just followed every one of those impulses, for better or for worse, and my parents let me. Uh, that was the great thing they gave me, was that freedom to, to bloom in all these different things which attracted me, including the things which they feared most. And then I did the thing they feared most, which was I left them and went to war. And then I did it again. It's the, it's the great unfairness that you put upon your parents and your, your loved ones and your family, because we all talk about the selflessness of service, but there's also something selfish about it, because those who are left behind are left behind. And what you know to be your situation in the world, when you're, when you're at war, there's very little to know except exactly your spot in it. At least you know that much, whereas the family you leave behind has no idea, and they're left to imagine it being worse and worse and worse. And when I was wounded in my second tour, then it became far worse because I couldn't even hide that I was actually in danger. <laughs> you know, as long as you don't get hurt, then maybe you're really not in danger. You're in a safe place. And, uh, and after that, you know, there's nothing I could say except, you know, everything's fine. Everything's great. You know, six more months and it'll all be over. Uh, but I didn't think I'd survive my second tour. Uh, I thought pretty much from the first two weeks <laughs> that I'd be killed there in Ramadi, which was a, just a, a vicious city by 2005 when I went there. We have a veteran right here who served with me in the Fifth Civil Affairs group. Um, and I thank you and I honor you for your service. It was a, my honor to serve beside you. And um, the, uh, the situation was bleak in 2005 especially, and in that section of the world especially, because it was the, the Sunni capital. We all know about the Sunni Triangle of Death, which we delightfully named for its little place in the world. But that's what it was. And... Um, so, because of the job that I had, I had to be very vulnerable and very visible. And I just figured it's at some point, you know, because I knew they wanted to get me, they would. And I just lucked out. They hit all kinds of people but me. And uh, that's, that's the thing about the randomness of war, is despite the fact that you prepare for years and years. It was, you know, 14 years of training for that moment. Death just arrives. It just picks you. You know, snipers are training too to shoot you. And roadside bombs are not random, they're deliberate. But for you, they're random. And uh, we lost some very good people in 2005. Uh, my best friend was killed in front of me in 2005. And they just picked his vehicle, not mine. Just for me, completely random. Um, so I was convinced in the very beginning that I was doomed in that tour. Didn't change anything that I did. It didn't make me careless, but, uh, but I went about things very differently. My first tour, I was a commanding officer of a light arm reconnaissance you know, company. And because my Marines expected me to be invulnerable, I wore it like I was, enough so that I believed my own myth. And uh, I just was convinced that I couldn't be killed in the first tour. It was ridiculous to assume that. And I acted that way. And there's something encouraging about someone who you know, has that attitude to a certain extent. In my second tour, I thought I was dead already every time I went out. And the interesting thing was that the, the Im, you know, immortality and doom produces about exactly the same lack of anxiety because you don't have a hand in either. You know, if they can't get me, well, why worry? And if I'm dead already, well, why worry? So um, a lot of people always think, oh, you must have been horrified all the time. I was, no, I really wasn't. I was worried for Marines that I was charged with. I was worried about them, but I was never really worried for myself. And there's some situations in the book which are, <laughs> you know, I probably should have been more worried than I was, <laughs> you know, in the end. But it's a, it's a strange thing. Uh, you know, war takes us to our absolute extremity in, in terms of the, uh, it's, it's a very practical thing and it's completely irrational, all together in one and you're, you're walking that line. And the thing you worry most about really is how do you preserve your humanity, your ethics and your sense of justice when things are literally uh, completely out of control. It's, it's, a, it's an environment of chaos. 
and Ramadi and places like that, much like villages in Vietnam, you know, they're full of kids. You know, what, what ends up being right? Um, we are also honored this evening to have Phil Caputo, who wrote probably the, the marquee book, uh, Rumor of War, um, the perspective of a lieutenant in Vietnam. Um, so we've got all kinds of Marines in the house tonight. If anything happens here, you're safe. <laughs> um, and we all read, so uh, you know, don't, don't believe all the preconceptions and <laughs> hear about <laughs> the Marine Corps. Um, so a long answer. I don't even know what the question was anymore. <laughs> That's how I wrote the book. <laughs> what is this book? I'm not sure. I just ended it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I It is. It is. But uh you s I mean, I think many many service members sever themselves from their point of origin. Some people you hear about, oh, I'm thinking about home all the time. I don't know, think I didn't think about home all the time. That's the cold part of it is that I couldn't to do that would have distracted me entirely from what was the business at hand. And so I submerged myself in the war and I stayed there until they let me out. And then I reemerged entirely and there was a dissonance between the war and home. I was back home now. And we're always we're always working those strange uh you know lines of connectivity. You know, where are we really? Where's our head? And some people can't adjust to either. And that's why you have an awful lot of these issues with, with people come back and they just can't deal with a regular life. They need the pressure that they were under. You know, it's kind of like being thrown out of the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> you know. Congratulations, by the way, nothing's a threat anymore. You, know, uh, you can just go to the grocery store and don't worry about the roads, they're clear. And it's very unlikely you'll be hit by anybody just randomly shooting their gun in the, in the College Park, Maryland today. Um, but you come out of that with all those instincts. You know, I, I drove down the center of the damn road for the longest time after I got back just because you don't drive on the side of the road unless you're crazy, you know. You know, I always check, check areas, you, you check your environment. I always had a hyper-awareness of my environment anyway because the artist is always looking for nuance and subtlety and inconsistencies. And my eye was always traveling. You can see that in the book. It's all about me seeing. The whole book is, is my singular perspective, you know. Uh, the view of my landscape and of the things in it. And because uh, that made me rel rel relatively well equipped for, for war because I was already looking for things which were out of place. Um, but, but yeah, the, the, the distance between you know, home and war, sometimes it's, it's, I mean it's far more than distance. You know, it's, it's environmental. And to be distracted is probably the most dangerous thing that I had. Some people cling to it. They need, they need to know it's there. For me, I left my wedding ring at home. I didn't want the war to know that I had another life. And if it took me, I just figured it ended there. So it's a, it's a strange way, I guess, of, of dealing with it. But it's how, it, it's how I dealt with it. And then you wonder exactly how much of you comes back. Because you, you know, once, you, once you sever enough lines, you know, the ship's adrift. And how do you kind of reconnect all those things? How do, how do you re-immerse back into something which everyone else considers normal? Um, I'm not sure. I stayed busy. I'm on a 50-state book tour. <laughs> <laughs> you want to buy a book? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, you know, I was thinking, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I first wore a poet and a reader to the show, but you didn't write poetry. So it's not my fault. It's forced. the wonder I had in searching into this is in my childhood. I have found it ongoing. And I thought of Wordsworth's poem, My heart was set when I beheld the moon. Hmm. And, you know, it goes on. Go, go. 
to a hearing out there where the child has brought his or her own just thing. Yeah, I mean, you're here, so it's fine. Oh, I don't mind being associated with words. Well, it's it's fine. Go right on thinking that. Thank you. I was just trying to, as accurately as I could, describe the environment that I was in, you know, and all of them. You know, there's sights and sounds to everything that I think place us well. Uh, if you can get a familiarity with with uh, with context and with all the things that go into the landscape around me, you know, the sounds of the woods, the sounds of the river, and the sounds of a just a simple warehouse space, sometimes fascinating to me. Well, that's that's the Marine Corps. We're amazing and horrifying. <laughs> uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's how we build ourselves <laughs> worldwide. But uh, yeah, it is it is a fascinating thing when you read it out. Uh, you're just doing it by rote repetition. You kind of just say it and you say it. But every once in a while, if you stop and think about the words, you're like, hmm, <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of bizarre. Actually, that I've uh, that I and my rifle are equivalent creatures in this world. Uh, it's yeah. It, the the book goes back and forth. I think you know I do write poetry, um, which you know I, it's going to take me hundreds of years after my death to make anyone care. But uh, <laughs> but I've got a plan for that. <laughs> I I write with uh, light fast ink. So uh, when the planet blows up, my poems will be blown into the universe, perfectly preserved. But uh, I think it disciplines my prose because poem seeks to do absolutely the most with absolute least. So it really takes all the clutter out of your writing. If you're really trying to refine things down, if you, know, you never use the same word in a poem twice other than the and things like that because if, if you do, the poem pretty much has to be about that word. Mm -hmm. um, because a poem really, I, I kind of make them into narratives. Um, they can be you know, two sentences spread out all wrong. You know, just, that it's a change in the way the prose is written, and you're allowed to really focus on particular pieces of that sentence in a way you can't in prose because it all runs together. You're constantly, you know, reading the sentences through. Um, and just, just out of spite, I could read one for you if you'd like. You know, vote. You know. uh, this one's called March. And this is only the third time in a book tour that I've, uh, I've brought uh, poetry has been brought out and. Uh, yeah back upon me. <laughs> so I thank you for bringing that into the world. Yeah. And there is, uh, there is some, <laughs> thank you, there, is some, there are some passages in here where I've, I've gone kind of, I, I straddle that line. But um, anyway, this is called March and it's about, I have two little girls, a seven and three year old. And so uh, you have to understand that the Barbie content of my house is a little horrifying right now. And <laughs> they like things that sparkle and uh, and I myself, not so much. Um, and we, uh, we live in the middle of upstate Michigan where excitement goes to die. And uh, <laughs> we, we tend to have heavy winters and you know, I, I, I f I'm fascinated by the things that have found a way to survive like rabbits and you know, coyotes and birds. So I'm always looking at those things and kind of seeing the land change as it does. It's transformative uh, that way. The room feels combustible. Cluster flies dead in the window sills, and I am awake too early, 
the floor covered with dolls, killed, smiling in their best dresses, <laughs> glitter sparkling. Outside, the snow is not made of crystals anymore, cream maybe, titanium white, soaked like paper swollen back into pulp, washed down by warm air, exposing rocks, the thorns of the land all pushing through. We could always see the fence posts, but they are darker in this damp, as if marking the graves of dairy cattle covered in cold milk. A rabbit lives under the dumpster, too many bones in the frozen ground to burrow, its manic path revealed each morning, stamped like woodprints on wallpaper. It knows what to look for. Everything buried remembers where it has already searched. Predators watching from the trees, inching closer, fascinated. All of us trying to read a pattern in the tracks. The hawk is not circling, is not like the spinning vultures sour with hope. No, the hawk is hunting, turning its head and flying straight towards murder. Beautiful, unsentimental. All the rust that dripped into the soil rising up onto the metal left out for the winter, like old blood remembering to circulate. The neighbor is smoking a cigar and drilling into the sugar maples, hanging white buckets and bleeding the trees. Too soon, it seems, but he must know something about the prophecy that I missed during the night, while the rabbit circled the yard and the hawk descended in its sleep. A poem. Run. Poetry did it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the book dallies with a few passages which kind of go into description that require a certain destruction of regular prose. I do err on the side of, uh, of that from time to time simply because I'm interested in the flow of things. Um, I was a stonemason by age eight, <laughs> professionally by age 14, actually, seriously and into my early 20s before the Marine Corps um, taught me how to dig holes instead of stack things. And um, it's because when I was very young, I, I saw stone as the most permanent thing. You know, we etch our names on it on graves. We build castles and temples out of it. Stone is this monstrous thing which remains always and forever. And so I, I wanted to work in the medium of perpetuity. You know, if stone is it, then I shall work in stone. And I built stone walls professionally, and, um, forts and all kinds of things out of stone only. And it was all about balance. It was all about fitting something exactly with the, the least amount of air in there. You see all kinds of wonderful stone walls in Connecticut as I drove in. I was like, man, <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. When you read, <laughs> when you read stone chapter, you're like, yeah, Connecticut has it, you know. I'm in Michigan right now, all we have is rolled stones left by the glaciers, and you can't do anything except make little piles out of them, you know, or else break them up. Um, so uh, I end up standing in Kuwait with the sand blowing past me, thinking, crap, this is stone. <laughs> this, is, this is a mountain blowing past me. Into the, it's going to be a beach. It's going to sink. It's going to stack. It's going to rise as a mountain again, and I'm not going to be able to mark any of it. I'm brief in the whole cycle of things. And uh, I mentioned, you know, there will be little passages in here which are kind of tiny ambushes. Um, ambushes. I'm sorry. I don't mean to scare anybody. <laughs> it's just the training. <laughs> um, there's always these little little moments. And I, d I, was, I was most concerned, I think, when I was young about disappearance, you know. Didn't want to disappear, didn't want my work to disappear. It's, it's the fear that all artists have, and trying to create something immortal that it won't be. And um, so building things I thought would be my way. And then I see things decline, and it upsets me. While my father was up in his workroom writing words, you know, the Bible's still in pretty good shape. You know, uh, the Greek tragedies, but somehow we have those. And my father, as the temples collapsed, was thinking words are better than stone. As he watched me build stone walls outside the house going, stone is better than language. <laughs> you know? So trust in the wisdom of your parents. <laughs> this little piece from, uh, from Bone. I knew that the world was wearing down and that what was worn off was piling up. 
I wanted it to be imbalanced in favor of piles, the cumulative somehow increasing more quickly than reductive, the earth expanding, our work contributing to a rise in the land. To think this way, you can never visit the shores of the sea where the collision of mass is so visible. The solidity of rock can be seen being randomly damaged, the violence of water so continuous, the planet's instability revealed to be obvious, and we are content only because we live lives too short to register the speed of ruin. I'll just be dropping stuff like that all the time. Just, <laughs> just bam. <laughs> bam. I mean, you know. Hey, I'm doing the readings here. You know. <laughs> 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 Soil. Yes, it's an empty soil where human records is filled with soldiers sliding into the unknown, searching the unknown, and then yeah. the idea disappears. Um, yeah. And that's when I thought of a humanity story poem, which where you know Yarn decay and rat collapse are wrapped downwards and bear the green green level. Yeah, I mean, uh, much of the discussion here is about mortality and the defiance of it. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's not untraveled territory. People have been worrying about, about these things for a long time, been writing about it really well. But all I could give you was my view into that from a very well, particular. No, yeah, I'm good for that. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll drop one. I don't want to hold anyone hostage, so if anyone needs to go, I totally understand. And then uh, if you want to pick up a book in the back, I'll sign it for you, and you can pick it up later. I know some people have, you know, days and lives and things like that, whereas I don't. I just, I just exist here. It's where I, I materialize and dematerialize. Yeah. It's you. You are chosen. Well, the, I don't know that I have the days required for this answer. Um, you can look me up on uh, Newsweek's The Daily Beast. I did three essays there, which kind of go into Afghanistan, Iraq a little bit, um, and, you know, shadow box a little bit with the situation. But obviously, um, I think everyone realizes that the reasons we went to war were proved to be inaccurate, incorrect, and thus the invasion was unjust. And how do you remain just in an unjust war is the hardest thing for, you know, the warrior afoot. Um, what I focused on was that my Marines were America, and it was my job to return them to it, doing as little harm as possible, and to present ourselves in a way which had as much humanity and ethics, despite the scenario that caused our arrival. Because in the end, my answer, I guess, is once you're there, there you are. You know? Uh, I didn't make the wars. Uh, Marines were sent to them. That's the job. It's, well, you know, I guess you have to ask, really, how does the electorate feel about the war they sent me to? Um, you know, is the overall arching question. It's, you know, we understand that the military is a tool of the state. We are the armed response to politics gone south. And um, I knew that going into things. You know, we, we should have learned a few things from Vietnam, I'm guessing. Um, but I don't think a whole lot of vets were consulted, and it didn't ever seem to be in wars. Um, so... I, you know, I can't, I can't really tell you, and in the end, we're, we've left Iraq, but not really. We're bound there with, with treasure, if not with blood, and there are thousands of families that can never be made whole, and on their side, 
more than that by a lot. So um, I almost, I'm, all I have is like cop out answers. You know, I went there to bring my Marines back. I wouldn't have gone if they hadn't been sent. And I went back again because I thought I could bring more back. I didn't have to go on the second tour. I went on the second tour um, because I thought the things that I did well by way of restraint in the first tour, I could apply to my second tour because I saw a lot of things being d badly done. We made terrible mistakes in Iraq, just horrible. Most of them were political and uh, what we should have had along with military commanders were Department of State, State Specialists saying, you know what Iraq's like? No, what is it like? <laughs> well, don't do the following things. Oh, great, thanks for telling us because we already screwed up and did all those. We went right down the list. Uh, and everything was happening independently. And so it just happened to be that on the Iranian border, there was a Vassar graduate who happened to be an artist running around not talking very much and listening and trying to figure out what the best native solution to native problems would be and then trying to do the best with his unit to encourage those results, even if they were ridiculous. If they were at least their desires, then it was my, my intention to bring those to bear and not to try to throw a template over Iraq, which is what a lot of places were doing. Like, oh, we'll just make Iraq democracy, add some water, it's a desert, stir, and just wait for everyone to be happy. <laughs> and, um, and things went, then went horribly south quickly because Iraq is three countries anyway. I thought, if I had been a monarch of some kind, that I would just make it into three countries. <laughs> hey, Kurdistan, congratulations. Uh, make your own visas. You know, this Sunni country can form itself, and hey, congratulations, you have all the arable land. Um, I hope you make a good deal of, of money that way, and hey, congratulations, the Shia have oil, and they get to have their country. Now you guys can fight over where the borders are. We're out of here. Um, so we're not good at this. Europe's not good at it either. We like to impose things, and then we like to talk about how it didn't work for some reason. Um, it's not our not our problem really, it just didn't seem to take. Uh, so we're, we're seeing that all transformative. I mean, we're about to see Israel make a wonderful mistake and bomb Iran and see how that changes the entire disposition of the Middle East. I mean, Egypt's teetering, Syria is a failed state, Libya is now in the hands of Islamic extremists, which makes me a little concerned. And uh, Iraq has been you know, decapitated and restored to some functional level, but not without horrible corruption and damage. And, uh, you know, Afghanistan on the other side of Iran is just an abject mess forever. Um, so we have Iran sitting in the middle as pretty much the only stable country with insane leadership. <laughs> uh, great rugs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the, uh, you know, <coughs> what happens there? I mean, we've got one, we've got two state places that are almost stable and they're about to fight. So uh, Hillary Clinton's got a really bad job right about now. Luckily, she's pretty tough. Yeah. What do you now say to the Well, I'm, il uh, I'm illustrating a a book on writing rhetoric of all things right now. I'm not writing it. I'm just being given assignments and I draw things. But uh, so I am working the hand on a very fine micron pens, um, which I think is, uh, is certainly satisfying to some extent, but I've been mostly in a sitting position since March 17th. This is my 106th reading, my 44th state. So uh, I really want people to read the book. <laughs> And uh, when I get back, I'll be home in a week because my wife's semester begins and thus changes the earth for me. So um, I'll go back and immediately get my hands dirty and build something. I'm going to try to build a new chicken coop. Yeah. I built one out of hay, hay bales to get us through the winter because I didn't have enough time or money to build something elaborate. But now that I can think it through, I've come up with the greatest chicken command center in history. <laughs> thing is a fully functional battle station <laughs> which looks like it's you know probably built by Queen Victoria uh, I've come up with all kinds of absolutely unnecessary frills for this thing don't don't tempt me 
I'm trying to get efficiency out of my Prius, you know, and Stones is going to blow it. <laughs> but uh, does everyone need to go? Yes. Um, no, I, I wrote home once a month, which is where my voice came. Uh, I, I, I wasn't a writer before, really, uh, because I was writing dialogue and, and not, not description. I wasn't, I, I thought, like I said, I could, I could do everything with imagery. So I was taking photographs and making films like this and, and, um, I was what? No, I, you know, uh, I was always seeing, I always see like a photographer. It doesn't matter if I'm being shot at or not. I'll see a tomato on the ground and go, ooh, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and as that's my images are of Iraq, uh, I took about one image a day because that wasn't my thing to be able to do. If I was a combat journalist or something, I would have taken a billion pictures. But I took one a day, usually. And it's when, when I could, you know, an interior space or I was, you know, in a place where I was safe enough not to disturb a patrol or something. So I went out and patrolled three times a day. Um, every day, and sometimes more. So I saw a lot of things. It was my job to see things and kind of assess the city over and over again as it came apart and we fixed things and we were blown up and we fixed them again. Um, not, <laughs> not much reward uh, in doing th some things. I was wounded, you know, driving infant incubators to a women's and children's hospital because I figured, well, I'm not fighting babies yet. So maybe I can make a good impression there. And the mothers might be happy with us for that. <laughs> and maybe that will form a change in, our, in their opinion. You know, why would they come invade if they're giving us infant incubators? Maybe somehow this language will begin to, to be important. Um, so uh, I would write home once a month because we had no press. Ramadi was too caustic and they, well, no one would come there. Uh, no one. No NGOs, non-governmental organizations, nobody. It was just they left the Marines there and, and some... Uh, some of the reformed uh, Shia army soldiers to try to work things out. And, of course, the Sunnis thought the Shia were the enemy, too, so it made for a great time um, as we worked all that out. But um, once a month, I'd sit down and go, okay, I'm going to figure out what's, what's going on right now because nobody knows, and I'll send a letter home. And I'll just make Xerox copies, and they send it for free, which is one benefit from overseas work in the Marines and all the services, you know, free mail. And so those letters, seven months I was there, seven letters, they'd either be a page long or they'd be eight. And they'd really try to place things, give you a perspective on what I see. And that was where I knew, and I grew up in a house of words, even though I wasn't a writer or a reader when I was young, really. Um, I knew that language was important, penultimate actually to my father and my mother, a writer and a librarian. It was like <laughs> the axis of humanities were forced to, you know, I, I had no choice, you know, but then when a book came into the house, you know, I kind of came in with that idea that my father would walk in and go, someone wrote a book. Look at that. All that, all that work, you know, and he had just had admiration for, for, for someone really fighting language to its conclusion as best they could. So I always knew that that was important. So when I wrote these letters, I really balanced my prose carefully. I chose words carefully. And that became kind of the first writing of the book, even though I quote from those letters two times in very small pieces in the whole book. I was keeping a journal there, but mostly it was not a w war journal in a typical way. It was because I didn't know what the hell was going on. So I was trying to track everyone and build family trees and find out why this part of the town hated this part of the town and who was fighting over water and, um, and everything, just trying to make detailed analysis of the city, try to, try to give myself a comprehension of it. And it ended up being 800... 1800 pages of finely written, you know, Abdul Aziz Abraham does not like Ahmad, and this is why, <laughs> you know, and I have both of them on the council. So this is how things are going to go every time I suggest something, you know, badly, um, because. And so I was trying to figure the city out. I was trying to figure the people out. I was trying to get a bet better sense of it. But I did, out of those 1800 pages. I use maybe, I reference maybe four of them in the entire book, because it's not a war memoir. Yeah, well also I needed, I needed to kind of have it come back and be immediate again, and so sometimes it was good to reference that, yeah. But it's not, I, I don't consider this a war memoir, I, I consider it a book that puts war in, in context, 
It's how we arrive at it and how we depart from it. Um, I'll send you copies. Give me your address at the end. I don't send them to people. They just, they just are. <laughs> but uh, if you're if you're interested, there's nothing I can say that hurts anybody now. <laughs> yeah. It's just kind of describing Iraq in 2005 in, in Ramadi, which is different than any other place in Iraq, as all places in Iraq were at that time. You can have a great time in Kurdistan. They loved us up there. We liberated them. It just depended on where you got sent. You know. Yep. <sighs> well, this is where I'm a complete hypocrite. Yeah, because my job is to keep them alive, and I know I know how things work. But I, I actually worry about my youngest daughter because she is a badass. <laughs> and she is tough uh, to the point where she makes me nervous. So I think my, my two daughters, uh, one of them is a social creature who will not bear hardship. I'm not worried about her. Um, my younger one, you know, I just have to keep the older one out of therapy and the younger one out of prison. <laughs> and, uh, and the Marine Corps might be the right place for her. She's three. <laughs> but, you know, personalities are set early. It's kind of what the books say, you know. That place, I already, I already see too many of, of too much of me in her. <laughs> so it's my job to encourage her, and at the same time to be horrified by what she, uh, what she chooses. It's the job, and then to run around, try not to be too much of a shadow, because, you know, I know myself enough to know that if she's got a lot of me in her, I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah, but I'm glad that the girl gets to be dangerous. You know, it's a weird world out there, and we need some tough women in. I went to Vassar, for God's sakes. <laughs> Toughen up, yep. Yes. Yes. I was lucky and some were not. And that's how it works. Yes, they did. And they saw my first daughter, which is great. I'm a little short on the 45 million that you need to have to, <laughs> to get in the game these days, but no, no, I, that's not quite for me. Well, you know, I was hoping uh, to be discovered as, you know, the royal child of some place and just kind of walk back and, you know, work Monica out a little bit, but <laughs> I was, <laughs> but uh, no, I, in politics, uh, I, I worked for a while, I, you know, I was a, as a student or major, I was a political science minor just because it interests me. Um, I should have probably been a history minor and a metaphysical minor and a philosophical minor and a poetry minor. But uh, in truth, I thought political science had, had a lot of this because, of course, the study of politics is the study of war and history and all that stuff and the, c and the discussion what little discussion there actually is between political parties. It at least tries to identify that. <laughs> and um, I interned for uh, the Department of State. It's not in the book because, you know, it didn't relate to an element. <laughs> um, but um, I was working, Mario Cuomo was, was governor then in New York, and I was writing some of his, you know, he'd show up for Arbor Day and he'd be riffing off of a speech that I'd prepared for him, you know, as a Vassar College student. You know. And of, of all things, I ended up writing a chapter called Wood, you know, talking about trees. You go, Mr. Governor. You know. um, but he was he was wicked smart. He'd just riff on his own anyway. He'd kind of get off the plane and go, where am I? What's the event? Thank you. And then he'd be elegant. And you're like, what the hell has happened? <laughs> um, but I saw enough of the inside to know that it takes incredible position to really create any change. And I'm impatient. So I think politics would make me crazy. I'd get all kinds of crazy. And then there'd be press conferences and it'd be recorded and then you know I'd be backtracking and apologizing. So, uh, no, I'd be happy to comment if they ask. They always know. Uh, if you read the Daily Beast stuff, if you read the commentary on, uh, on NPR, you can look me up there too. Uh, if they ask, um, out of spite, I'll give them an answer. You know, I always have an opinion. But someday they'll eventually shake out as interesting maybe. Who knows? We all have an opinion and I think it's 
I think it's the important thing right now, which we don't have, is that all of us aren't in the discussion. You know, we're kind of watching two football teams, and we all know that no players are going to change sides. So really, what's the discussion? Once you got your team's chant down, you're an idiot like everyone else, and there's no progress there. So, you know, every once in a while, just check out the facts. And talk it out a little bit between you. You know, there's always nuance in all this. Uh, and your vote counts. You can send people to wars with it. I'm not going to lie. Been there. <laughs> thank you, and thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure.